Welcome to Truth and Nothing But, Episode 8, Who Should Be Held Responsible for Slavery? This episode includes Mr. Dane Galloway. The link to the full video is in the description. Like and subscribe there. Peace. Throughout today's society of America, people are suffering from a variety of distractions that are placed in the forefront of the public's eye in order to maintain a particular degree of division amongst themselves. And when it comes to the history of slavery in America, some may feel as though slavery was abolished in 1865, when it was merely upgraded and transitioned into what it is known today as, which is employment. The industrialized version of what President Woodrow Wilson and his administration, along with multiple other co-conspirators like Henry Ford, J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and the University of Chicago, just to name a few, created and enacted into law for the benefit of 1% of the people. And their social engineering experiment also included control over things that would affect one's mindset, controlling what is known as American history, religion, science, social media, and public education. In 1909, in front of a large set group of law advisors and educators, President Woodrow Wilson was quoted stating the following, We want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society, to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific difficult manual tasks. End quote. In other words, compulsory educational institutions, which does not exclude colleges and universities, were handed down particular curriculums that taught its students how to become industrial providers that will benefit already existing companies of the open market throughout America's capitalist society, while the other class will be provided a much higher quality education to say the least, allowing its students to think freely and become innovators in having control. Making excellence inclusive rather than inclusive will require revolutionary change, not just in our practices, but also in our mindsets. Dr. Carl Snyder. Now, since you have been made cognizant of how a liberal education was designed for only 1% of the people, that should make you question everything that you were ever taught in school even if you earned a doctrine or any form of degree for that matter. Because it's not about you being taught the best education possible when you were being taught lies as your education to begin with. It's now beyond black and white issues. It's what's wrong and right issues. For example, over the years, the descendants of the indigenous Aboriginal Niji of Turtle Island or rather the people that are falsely misclassified as African Americans today, are owed a lot more than just a form of reparations. And those who feel as though they should be paid for their direct ancestors' involvement with the creation and industrialization of the United States of America should be paid. However, just a simple check or lump sum of money given by those who benefited from our ancestors' labor to make amends for the now over 240 years of hereditary damage this capitalist society indulged upon our ancestors does not, in fact, resolve the overall issue. And here's why. Let's take the definition of reparations, for example, the one which is heavily highlighted to the public, stating that reparations is an act of making amends or giving satisfaction for wrongdoing, maybe in a form of payment for damages. But let's look at another definition for reparations, which is an act of repairing or keeping in repair. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Sort of like when you take your car to a mechanic who has plans to fix the initial problem with your car, would somehow more damage is done? so that at a later time you are sure to return to continuously allow that same bad mechanic to work on your car unknowingly. Or I'll give you another example. It's like when you visit your doctor 
and he or she prescribes you a pill that allegedly cures one problem, but yet it somehow exposes you to several more. This is the problem with reparations. It does not fix the problem. It just covers it up for a certain time period. And yet the problem still persists because in order to fix a problem, we must begin at the root of a problem. This is why it is critically important for our people to know the truth about our past in order to see exactly where the problem began. In my previous documentary called The Untold Truth About Reparations, ADOS, and Slavery in America, I shared detailed information about the Civil War, why and how it was a labor dispute, and I also mentioned that Abraham Lincoln did not free so-called African-American slaves with the release of the Emancipation Proclamation or Proclamation 95. But what President Lincoln's Proclamation 95 did do, however, was ended the Civil War by quelling the advancement of military troops upon any people or person who did not agree with the United States government. Instead of fighting, it was urged by politicians for people to bring their disputes to Congress, but only through a representative of each state. This is how the United States was established, having learned how to govern the 13 colonies by watching the operations of the previous confederacies our ancestors owned. I will go into more detail about this later on in another segment, but what is important to note here is that in order to restore the union upon the remaining confederacies that would eventually turn into governments of each state, a set of reparations had to be agreed upon in favor of the copper-colored landowners, sharecroppers, or the Negro farmers, making this one of the main possible reasons why Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Now, reparations could have been delayed for the people of color due to a few factors. One, a study has never been conducted by any creditable source in order to discover just how much in a form of payment should the employees between 1776 and now be compensated for their binding contracts of forced labor. Two, there were subdivisions doing business as institutions, agencies, banks, and corporations that history fails to mention who worked as liaisons of the U.S. government directly involving themselves with funding both sides of the 61 documented wars of the 1800s by creating loopholes and other schemes that forced our ancestors out of their own lands here in America and also with streamlining the industrialized version of slavery that still exists today. Three. These companies were never held responsible for their actions in a courtroom, which makes it even more reason to reveal who should be held responsible still in order to bridge the gap between justice and equality for the indigenous Aboriginal Niji right now. The majority of bonds that were paid off by employers in order to hire prisoners of war as their new employees were done so by either bartering or loaning contracts out to employers as a form of business credit. This method remains intact still today. A bond is a quote, promise to repay the principal along with interest on a specific date. Some bonds do not pay interest, but all bonds require a repayment of principal. When an investor buys a bond, he or she becomes a creditor of the issuer End quote. So since the so-called slave master, or rather the employer, becomes the creditor, and the so-called slave holder, or rather the issuer of the bond, is the investor, then both parties are not only responsible for funding slavery, but should be held responsible for refunding the so-called slaves. Keep in mind that our ancestors were under the impression that they were not working for free and that this form of slavery or blind capitalism will benefit everyone, especially those who were the majority of the help that literally built America from the ground up due to promises or contracts that were never upheld by the promising parties. Hence the term indentured servitude. The noun indenture is a quote, written formal contract 
for services, a deed with mutual covenants. So who are these people that should be held responsible for the millions of broken promises, compulsory educational institutions, unpaid laborers and unpaid military soldiers who fought and died for the uprising of this country, destroyed legacies, cultures and spiritualities, inequality in workplaces, generational poverty, stolen land allotments, racism, concentration camps turned project housing reserved for only a large median of people of color, identity theft and paper genocide, and many, many years of injustice and discrimination? The answer to this question is very complex and will require me to produce multiple segments surrounding this topic to break it all down. But here's a critical example to make note of. The majority of our people now can recall hearing stories about how their ancestors and even some living elders were former sharecroppers, landowners, or farmers. And the way Hollywood paints the picture of American Indians should make you question why you would rarely see authentic photographs, painted or engraved images of the Hollywood depicted version of American Indians working in the fields anywhere across the southeastern region of North America. So how would millions of American Indians be able to survive if they didn't know how to farm? And for that matter, when did the American Indians have time to set some time aside to teach millions of so-called enslaved American Negroes how to farm? Before these same millions of American Negroes taught the incoming white foreigners from Europe and Africa how to farm? The answer is very simple. The American Indian is the American Negro.